everyone. <laughs> uh, today, I'll be talking to you about cuteness and why it's important. So let's start off with myself. Uh, my name is Jenny, and I also go by QDork on Twitter. Uh, I recently graduated from the NYU Game Center with a BFA in game design, and I've been making games for around three years at this point. Uh, so here are some of the cute games I've made. Uh, Slam City Oracles is a commissioned game that I worked with, uh, I worked on with Jane Friedhoff for No Quarter in 2014. It's a game where you and a friend slam around and tear down this colorful world filled with all these weird and silly objects. It's inspired by a mix of punk rock, Riot Girl, and bouncy physics. So try to create as much chaos as possible and have fun with that. Uh, I also helped make this game called Stellar Smooch with A.P. Thompson, who also helped me a lot with this talk, so make sure you go follow them on Twitter at Bad Tetris. Uh, Stellar Smooch is a game about kissing and loneliness, and it got into the IGF in 2014. We also made a cool alt control version, which we showed at the Wild Rumpus that year as well. You and a friend have to simultaneously squeeze this big red yoga ball at the correct time to get the space probes to collide with each other. The year after, AP and I teamed up again and we went on to create Be Glitched. Be Glitched is a game about insecurity in our computers and ourselves. And though it may look cute and silly, it's actually much more difficult than it seems. It's currently out on Steam and about to get an iOS release. So if you're interested in checking it out, definitely go buy it and give us our money. Uh, so, while I was working on Be Glitched, I also took this prototyping class taught by Bennett Foddy, where I made a game a week based on a specific prompt. So here are some of the prototypes that came out of that class. The theme for this one was 10 seconds, so Morning Makeup Madness is a game where you have 10 seconds to do your makeup. Uh, it's a personal game, and it's drawn from my own experience of waking up super late and not having enough time to get ready. Uh, Wobble Yoga is another prototype I made in that class. Uh, the theme for this one was Shapeshift. It was actually a Ludum Dare theme, and I decided to make this quap-like game where you have to contort this noodly limbed avatar through this series of like really challenging yoga poses. And this game is also based off of my own personal experience. So anyway, I'm currently working on a personal game about dieting called Consume Me, and it's focused on this specific time period in my life where I just wasn't super happy with the way I looked and with my body. Uh, even though the subject matter is quite dark, I intentionally decided to use this cute and silly aesthetic for the game, which I'll go into more detail later. Uh, so I just told you about the games I worked on. Here are some cute games that I like to play. So Animal Crossing is a game where you go fishing, catch bugs, and pay off your loans in order to acquire more debt from Tom Nook, the cute and adorable raccoon in the game. Uh, Neko Atsume is another cute game on my list. Uh, leave out food for these cats and they'll give you sardines, which you can use to buy additional food and toys for them later on. It's a game with pretty limited interaction, but I kept playing this one because I just wanted to collect all the cute cats. Uh, Threes is another one that I really like. It's this tiny puzzle game about matching numbers. And the design is really minimal but brilliant. And I think the cute faces on the tiles are just really charming and kind of add a lot to the look and feel of like the entire game. Uh, Piomori is a game where you want to stack as many baby chicks onto this plate of food and make sure they don't topple old over. Uh, you just want to try to make the biggest structure possible. And finally, uh, Survive Mola Mola is this game uh, that you can get off your on your phone. Uh, you're raising the sunfish and it's your job to make this Mola Mola grow as big as possible. But it's actually a game that's kind of dark because you have to kill your Mola Mola in order to make progress in the game. So you have to like unlock every single death method ranging from like choking on every single type of food to dying on every adventure that your Mola Mola goes on. Anyway, so those are just some of the cute games I love to play. But the thing is, in general, we have a tendency to dismiss cuteness. Uh, we associate cuteness with being childish and immature. But today, uh, I want to present a case for cuteness. So using my work as primary examples, I will show you how cuteness can attract, disarm, and engage. And you're basically making a mistake when you underestimate it. So my first point is cuteness grabs our attention. 
Many of the cute games I showed to you earlier are you know, all really quite charming and there's something about them that makes them feel really friendly and approachable. So I wanna use Stellar Smooch as my main example to show you how cuteness is attention grabbing. So the way you play this game is, uh, you, uh, so you tap the screen to release and make the space probes smooch each other. And the game is short, it's roughly 24 levels, and there's this lovely poem which AP wrote that acts as part of the level select. So before the game looked like this, it looked like this. Actually, it really looked like this. Uh, this is the prototype that AP made in a week with their Pixar art. Uh, but, uh, so anyway, this is the version uh, the first iteration of art after I joined the project, and we kept this visual style in for like a really long time. And even though there was like nothing inherently wrong with the art, uh, I felt like there was something missing about it. You know, the art didn't look terrible, but it also didn't feel really, you know, special. Maybe boring is the right word to describe it. Um, and even though I swapped out the pixel art with this new, you know, this new visual style, uh, it fundamentally didn't change the tone of the game. So the game still retained this very serious tone. And I mean, just look at the title. This is the original title of Settler Smooch. Dance and metal are just memories of an embrace, which is like a line from the poem. And the game just lacked uh, any sort of humor. So when I was staring, so like I was staring at this particular screen for a really long time and just trying to figure out how to make the art better than it currently was, which is challenging because, you know, how do you take something that isn't really all that bad in the first place and make it better? And so I just drew faces over the planets. And I know that sounds kind of like a silly answer, but once I added faces to them, there is something that felt right about the decision. By the way, uh, I think it kind of relates to uh, these images on the screen. So I don't know if anyone has heard of the term pareidolia, but examples of this phenomenon include perceiving a face within an in, in inanimate in object. So you know we see ourselves in everything, and this is just one of the ways that cuteness can grab our attention. So with that in mind, I basically started from scratch all over again. I began developing a new color palette for the game, and then I went on to add these little faces to the blobs of color, which would later become uh, the faces of the planets. And I just kept iterating on it and trying out different expressions. I wanted to give the planets their own personalities. And finally, I ended up with these five planets. I experimented with adding detail to them, but decided against that decision in the end because I felt like embracing a more minimal look made the game more elegant. So I took away the excess detail, limited the color palette to only six colors, and ended up with these five planets that are the current ones in the game. And something I realized in hindsight is that by adding faces to the planets, I took these elements that were originally part of the environment of the game and made them into characters. By incorporating emotional states to the planets, the impact of winning or losing a level felt much more significant. And the game actually responded to your actions. It allowed for more expressive and interesting solutions to other design problems we had. For example, this is just one of the problems that we were challenged with. Uh, adding faces to the planets helped resolve this one issue where basically uh, in the old version, this piece of like ugly UI text would drop down from the top of the screen whenever you lost. And it would give you the option of trying the level again or going back to the main menu. And I really disliked this because I felt like it looked incredibly jarring and was like very clunky uh, as a solution to this problem. So now when you lose, the planets will start crying and then like a restart button will fade into the corner of the screen. Oops. However, when you win, the planets, whoops, okay. Yeah, so when you win, the planets will smooch along and it's just like very clear uh, to indicate whether or not you won or lost. And I just felt like this ultimately was just like a much more intuitive and elegant solution because it just reduced all these elements that previously had been on the screen and really focused on the parts of the game that mattered. Uh, yeah, so. You know, the game shifted from being something completely serious and kind of boring and lacking any sort of humor uh, to something cuter and more simple and with like a lot more character. 
And I just want to quickly uh, talk about this process um, from Understanding Comics, which is this book by Scott McCloud. It's uh, basically, I'd like to say, the process that took place here is a form of amplification through simplification. And um, basically, what it is is, uh, like here's an illustration, so you know, to your left, you see uh, like a very realistic photograph of a man, but then like with each uh, depiction, as you're moving towards the right, it gets more simple and the image becomes more abstract. And it's like interesting to question, uh, you know, this image of like two dots aligned in a circle uh, still resembles a face and it's just like, as acceptable to us uh, as the image uh, of like the very realistically drawn man. So when we abstract an image through this process of cartooning, you know, we're illuminating a lot of details and we're just focusing on the ones that really do matter. Uh, it's like basically <laughs> taking uh, the meaning that we want to get across and amplifying it. So in Stellar Smooch, by adding these faces to the planets and making them cuter, it just allowed me to focus my attention to the most important parts of the game. And as a re result, it gave me the opportunity to just remove a lot of like this unnecessary detail left over from the previous art style. So don't underestimate the importance of adding a face to something and making it cuter. So however, the thing is, cuteness isn't always about being friendly and approachable. It can also act as a mask to hide darker motives. So in Animal Crossing, one of the first things you do is take a loan out from Tom Nook because you need to have a house in the game. And you need the loan to pay for it. So the game starts off by putting you into debt to this cute little guy. But the thing is, even after you pay off this loan, Tom Nook will always continue to take your money away from you. And he will always continue to put you into debt and acquire more and more property. He's kind of a little sinister in that sort of way. Like underneath this cute, cuddly face lurks this more you know, darker intent. And another example, maybe like a more clear example, is uh, of cuteness acting as a mask for something far more sinister is Flowey from Undertale. You know, he's one of the first major characters that you meet in the game, and he appears to be super friendly and cute and charming. However, it's quickly revealed that Flowey is actually incredibly evil. Uh, he provides an introduction to the mechanics of encounters by sharing these friendliness pellets, which are actually harmful bullets. So, you know, Flowey's just another character that, under, uh, that operates under this facade of friendliness. Whenever he drops this guise of cuteness, he often calls the protagonist an idiot. Which brings me to the main example of this point. Uh, in Beglitched, cuteness, cuteness acts as a mask and disarms people's initial expectations of the game, specifically in terms of the game's mechanics. Many people take one look at the game and underestimate the difficulty of it. They think it might be easy peasy to play it. Little do they know, it's actually a lot more harder than its pastel exterior might suggest. The cute aesthetic also masks the insecurity that the enemy hackers each possess. So each of, the, each of these enemies have their own insecurities which cause them to lash out at the glitch witch. So examples of this include the squid being worried about his skills, becoming irrelevant, and becoming washed up. The ape uh, feeling frustrated at his in inability to copy or ape the techniques of the glitch witch. And the bear trying to compensate for his lack of hacking skills by purchasing the most powerful technology. However, cuteness does not necessarily have to hide dark and evil motives. It isn't always just about masking insecurity. Cuteness can be a form of rise in rebellion by subverting people's expectations. So the rise of cuteness in Japan emerged in the 1970s as part of this new writing style. Many teenage girls began to write laterally with mechanical pencils, and these girls would write in big rounded characters and add these little pictures to their writing, such as heart stars, emoticon faces, these pictures would be randomly inserted and make it really difficult to read. So in many of these cases, uh, their teachers could no longer uh, read their students' handwriting and the handwriting style was banned in many schools. However, during the 1980s, this new cute writing style was adopted by magazines and comics and even put onto packaging and advertising. This form of cute handwriting, which once was banned in schools, has kind of led to this rise of cuteness in Japanese culture. 
And speaking of cuteness in Japanese culture, is anyone familiar with the latest Sanrio character? Uh, so her name is Agretsuko, and she's a 25-year-old red panda working as an office associate in the accounting department of a highly respected trading company. However, she's constantly taken advantage of and bothered by her boss and coworkers. She has to deal with getting much of the grunt work shoveled onto her. And there's this darker side to this seemingly cute character. So when Agretsuko gets fed up of everything, she goes and screams death metal karaoke after work. So that was kind of my final example for cuteness acting as a mask for something much more darker and more sinister. Agretsuko lets us, or has added dimension to her personality. You know, she's not only cute, but she's also tough. And it, doesn't let, it definitely lets us see how cuteness is flexible because it lets us look at how we can use this initial appearance of friendliness and charm to take people's expectations uh, and subvert them in regards to what's lying beneath the surface. Even with Be Glitched, it's a game that's telling you not to underestimate it based off of its looks, and I think that's pretty cool. So my third point is cuteness gives us room to experiment. So Be Glitched didn't always look this way. Even though it's a game about hacking, it doesn't really share the same aesthetic as most games that are traditionally cyberpunk. When you think of cyberpunk, maybe the first thing that pops into your mind are green, dark dystopias and uh, ultra evil villains, which is what the original art of the game looked like. Yeah, so here's the original prototype that AP made. It was dark, green, and kind of serious. And that tone also reflected in the gameplay as well. When I joined the project, I kept this secret Tumblr, which I would use to later help develop my aesthetic for Be Glitched. I'd reblog images that I found, you know, attractive and cute, and it kind of embodied a certain sort of mood that I was going for. And at the same time, I was also really drawn to these pastel color palettes and like this girly pink look. I also found these super cute versions of old computer UI. I loved how people created these really girly and cute interfaces. Something about the playfulness of this sort of imagery spoke to my inner 10-year-old who loves Hello Kitty and Tamagotchi. It wasn't just cute, it felt nostalgic in a way to me that green cyberpunk dystopias did not. However, this cute aesthetic doesn't really work for actual computer interfaces. Like, think about Click Clippy. Uh, it's kind of annoying and intrusive and gets in, in the way of you know, what you're actually trying to do. So I think this cute aesthetic really only works for games because games are their own aesthetic universes. Having to compete with a space in a space where everything else is at once is uh, where you really want to assert this actual visual difference. So that's how I started iterating on the game. One of the first things I did was swap out all the colors and develop a new color palette. By the way, I didn't really know how to do pixel art before joining the project, so it didn't look very good at first. Uh, but I continued to iterate more and more, and I just you know, redid the thing over and over again. And eventually, the assets began to look better, and the visual style began to uh, be more cohesive and clear to me. Um, and and yeah, it just like took a lot of trial and effort. I remember staring at the same colors and feeling like I was going crazy looking at this. Some days I wanted to rip my eyeballs out, but eventually after about a million iterations, I finally arrived with something that we both liked. And I'm really proud of the end result. Sure, I felt like this process took a lot of hard work and dedication and being critical about uh, you know, my own art, but being able to do something experimental in the first place and carry it out through completion is just like this incredibly invaluable experience to me. And it, in a way, uh, being able to experiment like this, not being afraid to make mistakes and try out weird stuff has bled into my other work as well. So here are just some of the prototypes with my design uh, that has been really driven visually. Morning Makeup Madness started out as something I doodled in Photoshop and then I found out that incorporating this drawing mechanic that uh, players could, you know, like do creative stuff with is like a really cool way to let players be expressive with their work. So um, after I like made all these assets, I just brought them into Unity and then uh, added some constraints with code, like a countdown and some colliders that would generate a score. 
Wobble Yoga is another dr uh, visually driven game. So I wanted to learn about hinges that week and joints uh, in Unity. So I kind of made this like little floppy toy and then I added some more constraints, uh, like very simple ones like adding a meter to the bottom of the screen and having poses that you needed to match. Here's a two player game where one player is the octopus and the other player is the hand with the fork. And it later evolved into this prototype, which is a, a single player game. Basically, the player controls my hand and depending on the food that you're holding, my head will react differently to it. So I'll chase unhealthy foods and avoid healthy foods. Yeah, so I'm not really the first person to do this. There are so many games out there that approach design with visuals first, or at least place an equal, if not more important, emphasis on the visual aesthetic. So Ho Hokum by Ricky Haggett and Richard Hogg is one example. Monument Valley by us two. Wrestling with Emotions by Team Laser Beam. Nog by Co-op Mode. And uh, Anything Made by Sock Pop. Uh, so we mentioned how cuteness grabs our attention and how it can act as a mask to disarm our expectations and how it gives us room to experiment. Now I want to bring you to my final point. Cuteness connects us. It's inherently relatable. I want to quickly talk to you about San, uh, Sanrio again. So I don't know if anyone else is familiar with this uh, character, but his name is Gudetama and he's a lazy egg, always with this face of despair and kind of lacking in spunk. And Gudetama is hard to motivate and has this extremely negative and defeatist attitude. On his official Twitter account, he writes, I don't really feel like tweeting every day. It's such a bother. I'll do it because the higher ups tell me to do it, but I know I'm gonna be eaten in the end. But here's the thing, Gudetama is super relatable. Everyone loves him despite his lazy demeanor and his negative outlook on life. I want to quickly bring your attention to a couple of games that share similarities to Gudetama's appeal. Uh, there are more and more creators right now creating weird and personal and really intimate stuff, but I'm just going to mention two creators that have personally inspired my work a lot. So the first one is Nina Freeman, who is a huge role model for me. She's maybe the reason why I started making personal games in the first place, because I saw and played her work, and it opened my eyes to the possibility of making really deeply personable, personal and vulnerable stuff. She recently released Kimmy um, for Humble Bundle, and I think uh, the Steam release uh, is gonna come soon, so definitely check it out when it comes out. Uh, you may also know her other game, Sybil, which she released like over a year ago. And um, Sybil's an autobiographical game uh, where you play as 19-year-old, uh, you play as a 19-year-old girl um, who has met this guy online and falls in love with him, basically. And, you know, her relationship with him is, un is revealed through this MMO that they play together. And I think this game does a great job of tying in this cute and relatable aesthetic to deliver this super personal narrative and help players situate themselves in Nina's point of view. Another one of her games that I think really showcases this point of cute being relatable and personable is How Do You Do It? You're this little girl whose mom steps out of the house and you're curious about sex. So you try to get an idea of what that's like by playing with dolls. And I think so many of us have done that as children. And I really like this game because I think it puts, uh, it celebrates teenage girls and their sexual agency. And it's finally this game which gives women a sense of autonomy without having to relate their self-worth to what a man thinks of them. I think it does a really great job using this cute visual aesthetic and these goofy playful mechanics uh, that just help get the point across. And this aesthetic just really resonated with me both as a designer and as a player. Another developer who I really like a lot is Lee Lea uh, Schoenfelder. You might have heard, her, uh, heard this game she made with Peter Liu for the Connect called Perfect Woman. And the main mechanic here is body bending. So you start as a fetus in your mother's womb and you perform in front of a connect to mimic various poses that appear on screen uh, to act out this character. 
It also uses these super goofy and bright visuals to poke fun and lighten this more serious subject matter, allowing us to engage and maybe think about what it means to be a woman in this society. Leia also made this game called Oot. The goal is simple, you have to have, a sex with, have sex with as many men before you get married. And the structure has a lot to say about the sexual constraints uh, that women find themselves in. You know, it does such a great job intertwining game mechanics and narrative. And the cuteness comes across here with this sense of humor, which effectively allows us to deliver these more serious topics. All these games that I just mentioned are games that use this cute aesthetic to get across these deeply personal and intimate subjects. Anyway, let's talk about Consume Me. Uh, like I mentioned before, it's a personal game about my experience with dieting. It's still currently a work in progress and mostly made up of prototypes that demonstrate the kinds of mechanics I'd like to incorporate into the game. In some of these prototypes, the player must fit pieces of food Tetris style on a plate to hit a calorie target count, or put the avatar through strenuous workout routines, and show the protagonist's distress as she tries on a crop top. By making you feel obsessed with calories, looking at food strangely and mechanically, and fret over losing weight, Consume Me puts the player into the mind of the dieter. These prototypes explore a three-way dynamic between the player, the character in the game, and the fact that the character is based off of me, the author. What does it mean to push and prod the character into certain eating behaviors when the player doesn't get full control of the character's thoughts and internal state? I know the game looks really cute and silly, especially for such a dark subject matter. However, the game didn't always have this goofy-looking aesthetic. It actually started out a lot more serious. Okay, so the next couple of things I'm gonna show here may be triggering to some people with body image issues and eating disorders, so I'd suggest looking away or, or prepare yourself. So this is actually, uh, I guess, like the basis for my game. Uh, back in high school, I was really not happy with the way I looked, so I decided to go on a diet. I found myself obsessively fixating on calorie counts and exercising, so here are pages from my notebook where I did these things. Little by little, I began to see progress, but it wasn't enough for me because I was doing these incredibly unhealthy habits, you know, these behaviors that uh, eventually slowed down my weight loss. So I just kept on increasing my efforts to doing something more drastic. I started like going on these really weird and extreme diets like the 2468 diet where I would end up cycling 200, 400, 600, 800 calories. And I definitely couldn't keep this up because it wasn't sustainable. So in order for me to reach my goal, uh, or this is how I thought I could reach my goal, I started developing this set of rules for myself to strictly follow. I would make myself write everything down that I ate. I would never allow myself to eat more than 1,000 calories a day. Some of these rules were really kind of messed up and ridiculous, like never eat anything you don't know the calorie count of, or wait at least three hours before sleeping in your last meal. I didn't know, but I guess I felt like I could control my destiny with these rules. I wanted to meet my weight goals so badly that I would do anything, even create, you know, like these ridiculous constraints up in my head, which, you know, kind of sounds like a game. And at my worst point, I would end up looking at these, like, very dark and depressing images that I would use as motivation to help me lose weight. And this was actually this aesthetic that I was considering about, uh, uh, considering using for my game. So here were some mock-up, here were some images I mocked up before I started prototyping, like as concept art. And yeah, I was really thinking of exploring this darker tone and mood. However, I think what prevented me from actually choosing this visual style is that I think there's a lot more nuance to dieting than just this depressing aspect which took place in my life. Dieting is awkward and strange. It's empowering sometimes, horrible sometimes, and we need a conversation with nuance and honesty about it. So I want to place the powerful feelings of self-consciousness and anxiety front and center with this discomforting undercurrent of humor. Is it okay to play or have fun with someone else's pain? By giving you permission to poke fun at my own suffering, these mechanics attempt to bring humor and vulnerability to this serious and uncomfortable subject matter. So yeah, I hope I've, uh, in these past 30 minutes, I've shown you how to make, uh, 
I, I've shown you that you're making a mistake when you undervalue what cuteness can do, uh, which brings me to the end of my talk. And just to quickly sum everything up, uh, you know, cuteness can be sometimes dismissed as childish and not really taken super seriously. But, you know, it grabs our attention. It can act as a mask to hide darker motives. Um, it gives us room to experiment. And it connects us because it's relatable and personable. Which leads me to say that cuteness is actually pretty valuable. Anyway, I hope I've convinced you that cuteness is, in fact, incredibly powerful and not something we should overlook or undervalue. There's a lot of potential to exploring design which embraces cuteness, whether it be through mechanics or through the visual style of a game. Adopting cuteness not only allows us to be attention-grabbing and disarming, but also encourages us to empathize, relate, and care. Thank you. It's good. Either way, should I do questions? Sure. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> I can't. Yeah. Hi. Um, on your big list of your like your teenage list, you had one. Uh, I think like five from the top that said, uh, maybe it was like record everything you eat, stay motivated, and don't tell. Mhm. Mm what is not telling? Wait. Sorry. Could you repeat that question one more time? It was, um, like one of the lists said. Uh, oh. Stay motivated and don't tell. Right. And what does that mean? Uh, well, because I never actually, uh, you know, lost enough weight to be like qualified as like anorexic, I never felt like I was qualified as being sick. And I felt like I was just, it was like a really shameful thing to be obsessed with and care. So that's why I was like, I don't want to tell anyone about it. That's what my mind told me. Do you have any examples of games that you think could have done a lot better if they had a cute aesthetic and missed out? Um, hmm. I don't want to like <laughs> say horrible things about other games like non-cute aesthetics, I guess. Uh, I don't know, I can't. I, I don't know. I feel like I can't answer that right now. Yeah. Um, you seem to be really natural at uh, finding and expressing cuteness. Uh -huh. Do you have any suggestions for those of us who uh, might not be so well inclined? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, you should definitely um, just like consume cuteness and like look at it around you. And I would definitely recommend like having a Tumblr and just reblogging stuff that you like and keeping a folder on your desktop that you know you just add images to. That's what I do a lot to help develop my aesthetic. And I think that anyone can do that. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, I'm really a fan of your work. Um, do you have any advice for people that are not necessarily represented within the games industry that don't have a lot of access to like games education for like tools that they could use to tell more about themselves, personal games, like to make personal games? Um, I would definitely suggest uh, using Twine, first of all, because I think that's a great tool, especially if we don't have a lot of uh, background knowledge in programming. Um, I think like my advice when it comes to this stuff is like go to game jams and meet people and collaborate with them and also be sure to finish small projects. So um, don't make something that's like really huge and ambitious. Just start small and like finish the game and just keep doing that over and over again. And you know, uh, be weird about it and don't be afraid to like talk about vulnerable stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was really curious about the relationship between visual aesthetics and mechanics, mm -hmm. and I wanted to ask if you thought there was such a thing as a cute mechanic. 
A, a what a mechanic? A cute game mechanic. A cute game mechanic. Um, I feel like some of the games that I uh, talked about, like Perfect Woman um, and How Do You Do It, have these goofy, silly mechanics, which I personally find cute. Um, so I would say, yeah, like games that, I guess, emphasize like physics maybe, uh, like looseness, wobbliness, I find really cute and charming, and that can be developed uh, using visuals first. And I think the other aspect of that is there's a physicality mm -hmm. about that sort of like messiness in those game mechanics, which is interesting as well, because that, that seems to be common across the games you were citing. Great, thank, thank you. you. Hi. How Hi. Are you? Thank you for your talk. It was very adorable. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, uh, someone said outside that you have like a YouTube channel or did I mishear that? Oh. Or like you do a show. Is that true? Um, I really wanted to do YouTube for a long time. So there's probably a channel out there that I uploaded videos to, <laughs> um, but I don't really have an official one okay. right now. Yeah. Would it be possible for you to reshare your contact information if you did that? Did you do that? I missed the beginning because there's... Yeah, I can stuff. definitely do that really fast. Okay. Maybe. And then uh, my last thing was, would it be okay if I answered somebody else's question? The person who asked about how to emphasize, how if they don't feel inclined on cuteness? Sure. Okay. Um, my other suggestion for that would be find somebody who really likes cuteness. Hi, I really like cuteness. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a good, yeah, that's a good suggestion. You, if you really want more cuteness in your game, find somebody who emphasizes it and ask them for help. So thank you. Yeah, nice to meet you. of course. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, I really liked your talk. I mean, people keep saying that, so I have to say it now. Oh, um, <laughs> wow. But it's also true. So okay. Um, where do you personally, I guess, cute and charming kind of go hand in hand, mm -hmm. but where do you kind of draw the line between them? Because there are games that are charming, but aren't cute. And there's games that are cute, but are not charming, so. I think uh, the way I'd like to, like, I'd like to draw the line uh, with, like, cute having this aspect of silliness and goofiness and, you know, doing something kind of like dumb maybe and being able to laugh at that. Okay. So, yeah. So it's kind of like self, like finding the humor in yourself. Yeah, well. yeah. I think that definitely ties into it. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think, oh. Hey. Oh. Uh, so I, am, I kind of interpret what you're saying is, uh, cuteness is something that allows us to address ourselves without neglecting ourselves. Uh huh. Uh, and I was wondering how you think that this kind of like personal game making that you're going seem to be going for with uh, some of your recent projects yeah. fits into the scope of uh, what people like Anna Anthropy right. is saying about like stepping in people's shoes and the, the likes of that. Um, is your question like how does my game making uh, or the games that I've made fit into this like overall, uh, I guess like uh, like all these games that are being made yes. about personal and intimate subjects like that? Yeah, I mean, I think that like people need to create, uh, like keep making them and I know it's a hard thing to do because they're not like really marketable or it's like really hard for that to happen. And I mean, I guess like my personal feeling about that is like, like we just need to keep making more of this and not be afraid to like charge for our work and like uh, ask to be paid for this hard work that we do, you know? But I think like at, at the same time, it's like equally challenging because like when you, you know, charge for a game, then like significantly fewer people are going to play it and buy it. And I guess like the way I'm approaching this right now is like I, I don't know, right now I just kind of see myself like making these really short, cute things that uh, draw people's attention and can be played very quickly. And I think that's like a good way of like uh, sharing your personal experience by making it like very uh, like visually focused so people like YouTubers and you know streamers can play it. Uh, but yeah, those are my thoughts on that. Thanks everyone for all your questions, but unfortunately we have to move on to the next speaker. So thank you everyone. Thanks Jenny. Thank you.